Go ahead and stand as we uh, as we sing this morning. Good to see everybody this morning. There, there, there we now you can hear me. Angels we have heard on high. Good morning. We're just a couple weeks away from Christmas. I want you to take a minute and just place yourselves in the shoes of Mary, this woman betrothed to Joseph. An angel appears to her and says, hey, guess what? You're going to bear the Son of God. Um, she's described as faithful. We see a very humble woman in God's Word. She responds to the angel. She says, you know what, if this is the Lord's will, then this is what will happen. Later, right after that, she goes and she visits her relative Elizabeth, who goes on to give birth to the one that we call John the Baptist. And after this encounter with Elizabeth, where God confirms with Elizabeth that he is indeed going to do something miraculous through Mary, this virgin, Mary responds by singing to God. And we get this text in Luke chapter 1 that's called Mary's Magnificat. And it's basically a song that God places on her heart that she begins to rejoice and sing to the Lord in celebration of the news that God has given her. So this morning, Lainey's going to read that Magnificat to us this morning. So Lainey, if you want to come up and read from Luke chapter 1 for us. And Mary said, 
my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is, is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his, with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you so much. We're so thankful that we get to come together as your church, and we just get to celebrate ultimately the resurrection. But right now, at this time in the Christian calendar, we look forward to the, the incarnation, the day that your perfect and only son, Jesus Christ, would come, be born of a virgin would grow in wisdom and stature and ultimately go to the cross for us. So thank you, Lord, for that great anticipation that we hold today. And I just ask that your spirit would dwell richly inside of us and focus our hearts and our minds on who you are and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. for the birth of Jesus Christ and sending him to, to die on the cross for our sins, Lord. And I pray that today, Lord, you just move in our hearts, help us to see the amazing wisdom that you have through your word. And Father, I pray that you just continue to draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I saw the Lord me and deliver me from every fear. Look on me on rainy nights. I'll never be a 
ashamed. They'll never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard me and saved me from my enemies. The Son of God surrounds you, saints. You don't live again. Magnify the Lord in me. Come exalt His name together. Glorify the Lord in me. Come exalt His name forever. Oh, taste and see. That the Lord is good. Oh, blessed is He who hides in you. Oh, feel the love. Oh, all you saints, He'll give you everything. He'll give you everything. Magnify the Lord. Come exalt his name together, glorify the Lord. Come exalt his name forever. Let us bless the Lord every day and night, never ending praise. the Lord every day and night never ending praise may our incense rise let us bless the Lord every day and night never ending praise may our incense rise let us bless the Lord every day and night Praise, may our incense rise, magnify the Lord in me, come exalt his name together, glorify the Lord in me, come exalt his name. Magnify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name together. Glorify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name forever. Lord, we love you. We're thankful that we get to come together and look at your word together. So we all know that there are lots of things that are um, vowing for attention in our hearts and our minds right now. So we just ask, Lord, for this next 30 minutes or so that you would just fill us with your spirit and cause us to focus on what you've said in your word. We know that it is right and true and perfect, that if we allow it to, it will cut us deep in, in our hearts and it'll change us and it'll... Um, Give us a great understanding of what you want for us. So I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can find your seat, and as you do, you can grab your copy of God's Word and turn to Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5 is where we are going to be this morning. If anybody needs an outline to fill in during the preaching, so you can stay awake, you can raise your hand right now, and Lainey will run by and give one to you. So... Um, <laughs> Maggie, I'm just thankful she brought you on. Maggie's the only hand in the air. She may just ignore it. So, thankfully. 
Oh, I shouldn't bring him in. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, Micah chapter 5. If you haven't been in the book of Micah for a while, that's okay because nobody else has either. It's a little bitty tiny book in the Old Testament. If you need to use your table of contents to find it, there's no shame in that. You can do that. It's completely okay and appropriate to, uh, um, to, to have to uh, uh, find that little book um, in your table of contents and find the page number. So beginning last Sunday is the time that we call Advent, and Advent is this just time in the Christian calendar that we set aside and really kind of um, just seek to refocus our hearts and minds on the incarnation, that event where God the Son would take on flesh and come down and live with us and dwell with us and be born as the baby in the manger with the shepherds and the farm animals and that whole thing, that whole scene um, that we know as Christmas. Christmas. And although it is certainly okay to enjoy the lights and the Christmas trees and the Christmas songs and Santa Claus and all those things. We know that for us as believers, there's nothing as important. There's nothing that rivals the fact that God took on flesh for us. So that's ultimately what we celebrate, that God would come down, be born, live, ultimately die a sinner's death in our place so that we could be reconciled and brought near to God. But Christmas isn't always easy for people, is it? Uh, Here are some things that are really going to help to put you in a great Christmas mood, okay? The term Christmas in July, I don't know if you've ever heard that terminology before, but it's a real thing. And that term Christmas in July refers to how people, many people will buy all their Christmas presents on credit cards. And it's not until July that they normally get those credit cards paid off. So Christmas in July is when you finally get paid for the gifts that you gave in December, which means then you get a couple months break and then you might do it all over again. Christmas depression is a real thing. Christmas is often associated with peace and love and happiness. So when you don't feel any of those things, it can put you in like this spiral of misery and sadness. This can unfortunately lead to substance abuse or even suicide. Speaking of substance abuse, it's this time of year that liquor and bar sales soar. Drunk driving accidents surge, overdose deaths surge, substance abuse counselors claim that addiction problems escalate in this time of year. Um, How about all the family problems? Now, I know that I'm the only one with a crazy uncle or two or three, so y'all's families are much more civilized than mine is, but um, Christmas time, sometimes you have to be around those family members that you spend the rest of the year trying to avoid. When I was in high school, And this type of action kind of continues into adulthood, but I'm I'm ashamed to say this, but at 16 years old, I knew this was the time of year that you dump your girlfriend because then you don't have to buy her a Christmas present. You can always get back with her in January. So what's the problem? You know, and that's, that's a really pathetic way to think, but that's kind of the way that we were raised to think. So unfortunately, suffering is something that has almost become synonymous with Christian with Christmas. And I didn't even mention all the people that we loved that have died, that this time of year reminds us of how much we miss them. So what we're going to talk about today is the role of suffering that sometimes takes place in God's kingdom in helping us to appreciate and follow the Messiah whose birth we celebrate during Advent. Micah this week is going to help to teach us about suffering. Now, I'll admit that during Advent, Micah is not normally where where we turn our attention to. Normally, we focus on the shepherds, or we focus on the actual birth narrative of Jesus Christ. Maybe we focus on Mary. Maybe we focus on her Magnificat, which was read earlier. But um, Micah still introduces to us a lot that has to do with the Christmas account. Here's what's happening in the book of Micah. Micah is this tiny book in the Old Testament. Micah is considered a minor prophet. Remember, he's not a major prophet just because his book is shorter than Isaiah or Ezekiel or Jeremiah. But Micah is prophesying about 700 years before Jesus Christ would be born. So if you're new to the Bible, just know that when Adam and Eve sinned against God in the Garden of Eden in Genesis, and they eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God had told them not to eat, they're kicked out of the garden. And the question of the Old Testament is really, how is that relationship that mankind had with God before sin came in, how is that relationship going to be restored? So what God does is God chooses a people. He covenants with Abraham. He chooses Abraham, says, Abraham, out of your family and your lineage, all the nations are going to be blessed. He promises the Messiah. So you follow the the, the, the storyline of Scripture. You have um, 
Abraham's family ultimately being um, slaves in Egypt. God sends Moses to deliver them out of Egypt. They wander through the promised land for several decades. They find themselves in the promised land. They establish a quasi kind of nation. Then eventually they get a king, Saul. Then they get David. Then they get Solomon. Then after Solomon, the nation divides. You have Israel, the north, and Judah in the south. That all happens in the course of several, several centuries. And it's at that point when the nation is divided that Micah comes into the scene, and Micah is given this vision by God. Micah is this prophet in Judah that is recording this message that God has given, and part of that message is the promise of the Messiah being born, who would ultimately take upon himself our sin. Remember, Micah is telling us this seven centuries before Jesus would be born in the manger to the Virgin Mary. But to the particular people that God is giving this message to through Micah, there's a great deal of suffering that those people are going to go through as they inch toward the birth of that Messiah. And like I've already said, there's lots of things associated with Christmas for folks, and some of them are incredibly good, and some of them are incredibly difficult. So what we're going to see today are two ways that God works through suffering, maybe specifically during this Advent time. So here's what I want you to know first of all. Know that God sometimes allows people to experience tremendous amounts of suffering. Just start out by knowing that God sometimes allows people to experience tremendous amounts of suffering. Look in your Bible to the first half of Micah chapter 5, verse 3. It says, Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Now, she who is in labor has given birth is referring, of course, to the Virgin Mary. But just, just stop right there and let's just think about this first part of verse 3. We'll come back and finish up the verse a little later. If you remember last week, we looked at verse 2, and it talked about how God had chosen that from Bethlehem, which was the city of David, the Messiah would be born. This is, of course, the event that we celebrate at Christmas. The Messiah would be born in the lineage of David and would establish a kingdom that would never end. We discussed how that kingdom is not based on some geographical boundary. It's not based on like some political line or a government or, or anything like that. Instead, it's based on the gospel. So as the gospel goes out into people's ears and changes their hearts, you know, the kingdom of God is advancing, it's, it's influencing, it's spreading out. Now, when God gives that message to Micah, this prophet in Judah, it's 700, I know I've said this, but I really want you to understand this, it's 700 years before the Christmas event takes place. That is a long time. Time. Now, just so you know how long 700 years is, I want us to think just briefly about what was going on in this world 700 years ago from today. Now, when Micah was prophesying, prophesying it's set 2,700 years, 700 years before Jesus. Jesus would be more 2,000 years up until today. But even just 700 years from today, uh, I don't know much about what was going on 700 years ago. I know in 1492 is when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. I do remember that. But in the 1300s, which would be about 700 years ago, that's when the Black Plague stormed across Europe, killed a third of all people. That was a big deal. The Ottoman Empire was just being established. The Mali Empire in Western Africa was at its height. The world was a very, very, very different place 700 years ago. That's the amount of time that separates the giving of that prophecy from the fulfillment of it. So we're talking about the time that Micah is given this prophecy to the time that Jesus is actually born, the Messiah is actually born, is a tremendous amount of time. Now, here's what would happen in that 700-year period. Judah, where Micah is prophesying, would absolutely be demolished. I mean, just destroyed. It happened when the Babylonians would rise up, they would march an army into Judah, they would destroy the country, and they would kill bunches and bunches and bunches of people. I'm just going to read one account for you from 2 Kings chapter 24, verses 11 through 14. I don't know if Graham's going to have this on. You are? Okay. I was late in giving him my text, but this is what this text says. It says, The king of Babylon took him prisoner. It's speaking of the king of Judah at that time. So it took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign and carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord, which Solomon, king of Israel, had made. As the Lord had foretold, he carried away all Jerusalem and all the officials and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and all the smiths 
not remain, none remained except the poorest people of the land. So it wasn't just that their country had been conquered, it's that they take all the political and all the military and all the religious leaders, all the craftsmen that were good at their trade, and they took them all out of the land and they made them live outside the city of Babylon. That's why, remember the book of Daniel, Daniel is living outside of the city of Babylon. It's during, during that time period. So families are killed, people are displaced, buildings are burned, homes are destroyed, crops are destroyed. It's really, really, really bad. Now, going back to Micah chapter 5, verse 3, when Micah says, therefore God shall give them up, all of that suffering that came on the people was God doing just that. It was God giving the people up to receive what they had ultimately asked for of God. Now you might say, well, the people did not ask for their country to be destroyed, did they? I mean, the people did not ask for their crops to be burned or for their houses to be dis demolished. They never said they wanted their women raped and their homes burned. And that's true. They never said that. But they did make it clear through rampant and unrepentant idolatry that they didn't want God. They made it clear that they did not want God's leadership in their families or in their homes. They didn't want to worship Him. They didn't want to follow Him. They made that crystal clear. Which brings me to answer the question, why does God sometimes allow people to experience suffering? Why does He allow it? Well, I, I know of at least two reasons. Two reasons. These are going to be under letter A and letter B. I'll give you A now. Under A, sometimes suffering might just be God giving us what we ask for. Now, I know that's hard to accept, but sometimes suffering might be God giving us what we ask for, which is, I think, a lot of the suffering that we see with the Israelites in the Old Testament. It is simply the result of them wanting a life that is not lived under the authority of the God of the Bible. You know, I mean, think about a teenager. I'll just use myself as an example. I don't know about y'all when you were teenagers, especially teenage males, but when I was 15, 16 years old, I knew everything. There was nothing left for me to discover because I had figured it out and I was absolutely positive of that. So I would tell my parents, you know what, I'm going to do fill in the blank, X, Y, Z, whatever it happened to be. And they might say, now, um, you know, that's dumb. <laughs> it's a stupid thing to do. And I might say, look, what do you really know? And uh, I might say, I'm going to do it anyway. And they say, okay, well, don't claim that we didn't warn you. And then I'd go do it. And sure enough, I'd learn what? I'd learn that they were quite a bit wiser and smarter than I thought that they were. But that rebellion would often bring with it suffering, the way that a lot of rebellion does. This is a point where God is allowed, there is a point where God is allowed to allow us to do that which is harmful to ourselves. He knows that it's harmful to us, but he allows us to do it anyway, hopefully so that we will learn and not commit the same thing again. So suffering sometimes might just be God giving us what we ask for. Sometimes, key word sometimes, suffering is self-inflicted. It just is. Actually, listen to what God says in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. This is a lengthy passage, but it's a really important passage. I think we're going to have it on the screen for you. This is in Romans chapter 1. The apostle Paul writes to the church at Rome, and he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and, and, and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Here's what this text is taught. Paul, Paul is basically making the case that we can look out at creation and see the mountains that God has created, or the oceans that he's scooped out, or the wildlife, or even humanity, and we can know that God is there just by seeing his creation. That's why he says at the end of verse 20, they are without excuse. So if someone was to ever say, um, you know, there's no evidence for God or there's no reason for me to believe in God, that's why God has given us his creation. His creation is screaming out to us that he is there. Verse 20 says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. That's meaning that rather than looking at creation and understanding God is giving us a, a reason to believe in Him, they begin worshiping the creation. 
And then what Paul is about to do is he's going to tell us three times that God gave people up to their foolish, sinful desires. Verse 24 says, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Verse 28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. When it says, look, three times God gave them up, imagine that it is God giving people over to what they want and allowing them to suffer the consequences of that decision. They've lasted for generations, screaming to God, we do not want you. We have life figured out. We're doing just fine by ourselves. And God says, okay, here you go. Have fun. And in this text, it's really referring to how as the wicked deserted God, God deserted them. No longer operating with divine restraint, where he kept the world from murdering itself, but instead fully allowing people to seek exactly what they desire and experience the heartache that comes with it. And there is heartache that comes with it. I mean, think about it with your prayer life. Can you imagine what your life would be if God had said yes to everything you'd ever prayed for? Now, some of you might say, well, my life would be a lot better, and maybe it would, but I can tell you my life would be a lot worse if God had said yes to everything that I'd ever asked of him. Because God knew exactly what he should say yes to, and God knew exactly what he should say no to, because God could see every puzzle of my life being put together. Sometimes, maybe oftentimes, God says no to us because he's protecting us, and he knows what will happen if he gives us what we actually want. And sometimes the suffering that comes with his way is drastically less than the suffering that comes with our way. I want to take just a second and tell you all about the the last time that I had a kidney stone. Now, many of you have had kidney stones before. I'm at an age where I don't care if you think I'm tough, okay? I don't have to be strong in your eyes. I don't have a high pain tolerance. Everybody can know that. I'm okay with you knowing that. Um, I'm not 18 anymore, not interested in impressing you. Both times I've had kidney stones... I'm not exaggerating. I was crying like a baby on the bathroom floor. That's what I was doing. The last time I had it, I'm in the ER. They give me some drugs, which I was very thankful for, and they did help with the pain quite a bit, but it still hurt really bad. And the one way that God has blessed me in the two kidney stones that I've had is they were both fairly quick, like two or three hours, and then they're done. So I asked the doc in the ER the last time that I'm there, I'm, so, I'm like, okay, so when I get kidney stone number three, like, what, what, what can I do about it? Like, can I prevent it? Can I stop it immediately? Like, what can happen here to kind of make this go by and not be an issue? And he said, probably nothing which I wasn't happy about. So I said, okay, so in the future, I guess what I'll do is I'll just stay home and just deal with it rather than coming to the ER and paying the ER fee and everything else. And his response was, well, most people think that they're going to stay home and deal with it until they end up lying on the floor crying like you were just a minute ago. And then they come into the ER and we give them some drugs to help take away the pain. I said, well, that sounds about right. But You know, in that situation, neither one of those situations is good, right? Both of them are horrible. Like, stay home, experience horrible pain, go to the ER, still experience horrible pain, but maybe a little bit less pain. Still pain, but less pain. Well, have you considered that sometimes we place ourselves in a situation where pain and suffering are going to take place? God offers a situation where less pain and suffering is going to take place. If we got our way, if we would allow us to completely get our way, we might choose the way that 
as incredibly more pain and suffering. So sometimes the pain and suffering that comes with God is significantly less than the pain and suffering that comes with our way, but we can't see that because we are not outside of time like God is looking at everything at once. So what are we left to do? Well, we're just left to trust that God is God and we are not and that he knows how he's putting this world and our lives together and trust that he's going to do it in the way that he deems necessary. Now let's move on and see letter B. Here's another reason God sometimes allows people to experience suffering. Sometimes suffering is just the result of us living in a fallen world with fallen people. So some... Letter A was basically, sometimes suffering is almost self-inflicted. I've done that. You've probably done that as well. Made decisions that brought about suffering. But not all suffering is like that. Sometimes suffering exists because the world is difficult and the world is hard. Before mankind chose sin in the Garden of Eden, think about this, there was no suffering. Do you realize that? Su suffering was not something that Adam and Eve dealt with. There was no cancer. There was no divorce. Nobody was killed by a drunk driver. Babies didn't die. Actually, nobody died. Death was not a thing. I mean, that which makes life unbearable today, it was not in the world. But when Adam and Eve choose sin and they rebelled against God and were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, there was an invasion of sin and death and suffering that marched into their world. And that's when this life became difficult. Life wasn't originally supposed to be like this. And sometimes we experience suffering not because we necessarily brought it on ourselves, but sometimes we experience suffering just because we live in a world that's jacked up. And that's just the way it is. Actually, did y'all hear about the cop that took out the wrong car on the high-speed chase in Arkansas two months ago? It's an amazing video. If I felt better about it, we'd just show it right now so y'all could watch it. it. You should watch it this afternoon. So there, there were several officers that were in pursuit of a couple cars that were running from the law. I don't know why they were running. I never heard anything like that. A pit maneuver is, I'm told, and I've watched enough uh, cop videos to know something about this, but a pit maneuver is basically when the, the police will take their front bumper and they'll kind of hit your back fender, your back bumper on the side, and they kind of spin your car around. It's a way to stop your car whenever you're you know, being, being chased. Well, these cars that they're chasing, they're trying to catch up with them on the highway, and one of the highway patrolmen in Arkansas pits a car that was just driving down the highway thinking that it's one of the vehicles that had run away from the cops. So they pit the car. They spin this car around. All this is on the video because it's on the dash cam. They run up to this car, you know, weapons drawn and everything else, and they drag this guy out of the car. They arrest him. Vehicle is damaged. His girlfriend or wife is sitting in the passenger seat. It's obviously a very emotional event. And you can watch the video for yourself this afternoon. It, 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 the guy is telling them, look, you've got the wrong car. Like, I am not the guy that you're chasing. This, I am not the right person, which is probably exactly what I would say if I was running from the police as well. So I <laughs> can completely understand that. But I think something that was kind of funny that he did say as they pitted him, as they're pulling him out of the car, the guy says, do you really think I'd run from you in a V6? which I thought was, I was like, yeah, you're probably not going to run from the cops in a V6. I agree with that. But here this guy is, imagine this, minding his own business, driving the speed limit, yielding actually to the lights. He's doing everything that you're supposed to do only to get drug out of his car by gunpoint. Now, suffering came into his life, not because he did anything wrong. Suffering came into his life because he did everything right. Like he followed the law. He did exactly what he was supposed to. Not to mention that guy's day was a bad day, but the trooper who was trying to do his job and obviously made a big, horrible mistake. He resigns from his job. He um, actually uh, takes an early retirement, and he will spend the rest of his life very embarrassed, obviously. And every time he goes out in public, he'll have people thinking about him and thinking about the one bad decision that he made, even though he was trying to do what was right. So I personally feel horrible for both people involved. The point if I can just summarize, is that sometimes suffering is self-induced, but sometimes it is not. Sometimes you're going to experience hard stuff, difficult stuff, not necessarily because you've done anything wrong, but just because the world is very, very, very wrong. So, remember we're talking this morning about two ways that God might work through suffering according to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. The first way was just knowing that God sometimes allows us to experience a tremendous amount of suffering. 
Now we're going to go back to Micah chapter 5, verse 3, and we're going to see the second way. I want you to just know that God sometimes will use that suffering to bring glory to himself. God can use suffering to bring glory to himself. Obviously, the most perfect example is the death of Christ, which is suffering at its highest form, and God uses that death of his perfect only son, Jesus, to glorify himself through the salvation of sinners. But look at that last half of Micah chapter 5, verse 3. The first part said, Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she was in labor has given birth. And the next it says, Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. Now this statement is given to the Israelite people. Their nation would be destroyed, they would be deported, they would later return to the land, and they would rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the wall, rebuild the temple. Lots of good stuff would still happen. And then several hundred years after that, Jesus Christ would be born. He would be born a Jew, know that God had chosen the Jewish people as his covenant people out of all the people of the world. The Jewish people, by and large, reject the Messiah. What do they do with the Messiah? They kill him, ultimately, right? But what we find is this in this Messiah is that God is revealing his plan to save not just Jewish people, but instead that this Messiah would come with the gospel message that would now invite people of all different ethnicities and all different skin colors and all different nationalities and all different languages to repent of their sins and trust in the work that this Messiah would do on the cross for us. There was an expansion of the gospel that came through Christ so that God... God's chosen people are now the church, like all across the world, His people that He has saved, that He has regenerated, that He has changed the hearts of, who have repented and believed in Jesus Christ. But in the course of all of that history, all of that rebellion, everything that took place, there was still tremendous suffering that God's people had to go through. So what I want to do now is I want to give you two encouraging facts that can help to strengthen us as we endure through suffering. Both of these facts I hope are encouraging. I'm going to give them to you basically one right after the other. First, under A... We can be strengthened in suffering by remembering that there are more people that God desires to bring into his kingdom. I mean, in verse 3, it says, Then the rest of his brothers shall return. So God was telling them, It's going to be rough for a time, but after that, it's going to get better. Like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And then I'll give you B as well, because both of them, I think, are so closely connected. Those people aren't just people that he's bringing into his kingdom. Instead, they are your future family members. Because what does the text say? What, what word does it use? The text calls them brothers, brothers, siblings. In other words, it's not just bringing the expansion of a church. It's the expansion of a family. You know, church is actually supposed to be a family. That's really what it's supposed to be. As a matter of fact, if you are a believer, a Christ follower, and you're in a family where you've got a whole lot of biological family members that aren't Christ followers, which is kind of the way that my extended family is, you know, I remind myself that as much as I love my biological family members, for those that aren't Christians, I'm not going to be spending eternity with those people. Instead, those that have repented of their sins and trusted in Christ and following the Lord, those are actually, at this point, my family members. Those are actually the ones that are closest to me. Now, that can be a little depressing for some of us because, gosh, I mean, you think about people that you love, you grew up with, maybe parents, maybe children, whatever it happens to be, and to think of eternity without them, that is... That's not necessarily easy to think about, but at the same time, it's incredibly encouraging because you have this family that is bigger and greater and stronger than anything that you could ever have biologically. Actually, let me just tell you about one of the international mission trips that I was on. I've had the privilege of, in the last you know, 15 or 20 years, whatever it's happened to be, going on probably 20 international mission trips. Now, the countries that I've been to, most of them... Well, all of them more than once have been Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, and I've been to London, England on several chips, trips as well. And on one of the trips to El Salvador, this was probably 15 years ago or so at this point, we were working with a church in El Salvador that was ministering in a really difficult, dangerous area in El Salvador. Now, I know we think about Mexico and all of Central America as being poor and dangerous, but 
Central America is way worse than Mexico. Like Honduras is probably the worst, and then El Salvador is probably the second worst, but it's right there with it. And on this trip, one of the things that we did was we worked with this, that we set up this medical tent where we had free health care offered, and we had a doctor and some nurses that came with us, and we had a whole bunch of medication that we gave out and whatnot. And you might say, well, you know, what do you know about medical issues? And the answer is, I don't know nothing about medical issues. I was there to preach and share the gospel and encourage people, et cetera, et cetera. So we set up for like maybe two or three three days next to this huge encampment of what I would call improvised houses that were made out of sheet metal and tarps and, you know, plastic if they could find it and any type of a canopy material, anything that you could tie together to make a home, that was essentially what they were using. Now, El Salvador has at times had horrible floods and mudslides and it will displace hundreds or even thousands of people at once. And there had just been a flood that came through that area that destroyed the homes of hundreds of people, and it just washed their homes completely away into the ocean. So most of them had just set up shop in this field next to town. So there were essentially what we would call hundreds, maybe a thousand even, squatters who had just picked this field and started building the homes the best that they could to kind of stay dry and live life to the best ability that they could, even though we would look at the homes and definitely say that these are not habitable. And the bigger problem was not that their housing was so poor. The bigger problem was honestly the gangs were so heavy in that type of an area because there's lots of drugs and prostitution and there had been a murder there the week before we were there and there was just a regular occurrence for them to have somebody killed. And it was bad enough that while we were there with our medical tent set up right outside of this little commune or this little village, the government had actually sent army soldiers who were sitting there in trucks with M16s, you know, waiting just in case the gangs tried to do anything or steal anything from us. But there was at least one family in that neighborhood that were believers. And we were there specifically because of them. And they hosted a weekly Bible study in their yard. And they had another weekly event where they would invite all the neighborhood kids in. And they'd have a little kids event for them with the kids Bible study. But one of the things that I took away from that trip that really impacted me at that point and has continued to impact me for the rest of my life and encouraged me to go on so many other you know, international mission trips after that is simply that, okay, so I'm in, I'm in El Salvador. Different language, different culture different food, different money. Um, there's no, where we're at, there's no indoor plumbing. So, you know, if you need to go to the bathroom, they point you to a back room where there's a bucket sitting there and that's what you do. No electricity, living on dirt floors. And this couple who opens their home to the neighborhood every single week, they don't know English. They never been out of the country. Most of them have never even seen a white person in, you know, in person anyway, that all they have is a Bible and faith in the Lord. And I, as a fellow believer, have actually more in common with them than I do with some dude that I went to high school with here in town who lives without Jesus. Like, I actually have more in common with that couple in El Salvador, even though we do not share the same culture, language, nationality, anything else, I share more in common with them than someone here in this little community who knows not the Lord. I have more in common with them than even a family member that I saw every week of my childhood who doesn't know the Lord. Maybe we even share the last name, but that family in El Salvador is actually my family. The person in China who loves the Lord, the person in Nigeria who loves the Lord, the person in Brazil or Australia, if they bow the knee to King Jesus, they and I have a deeper, more lasting connection than even my biological family members. Friends, what Christ does, what the gospel does, is it expands a family. And it is bringing into this family, giving you new siblings in the Lord, and that's the family that actually is going to last. Like, that's the family that we're going to spend eternity with, celebrating Christ, worshiping Him, following him. And I want you to know that expansion of that family is available to you as well. Maybe you sit here as a person that you're not really part of that family at this point. Maybe at this point in your life, you're on the fringes, you're checking it out, you know, um, you're on the outside looking in the window trying to figure out what this family looks like. And um, once you know ahead of time, we have some crazy uncles in this family, uncles and aunts and crazy people in general, but it's still a good, growing, wonderful family. And maybe you need to become part of that family. 
Maybe you need to say, today is the day that I'm repenting of my sins and I'm trusting in what Christ has done for me and I'm going to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. And if that's you, I want to talk to you after the service. I want you to catch me after the service. I'm going to be around here, promise you I'm not going to leave. And I want you to come up to me and just say, I want to become part of this family. I'll tell you more about what it looks like for you to begin following the Lord. Lord, we love you so much. We're thankful that we get to study your word together today on the Lord's Day. Grateful for the fact we just get to be together as your family. And we all know that, you know, Advent time might be easy for some of us, but there are a whole lot of us that it's not easy. Finances are tight. It reminds us of people that we've lost. Um, it reminds us of maybe biological family relationships that need to be fixed. And it's just not easy for everyone. So I pray that you would give us strength. You'd fill us with your spirit. You'd also put on our minds and hearts those around us that maybe we need to reach out to and encourage. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing our closing song. for you. Um, if you'd like to worship the Lord through giving, there's a podium there in the foyer, and you're welcome to um, drop your, your offering in the top slot of that podium. You can also give at the livingword.church. Youth group is starting Sunday, January 7th, Sunday, January 7th. So if you have a um, teenager, what's the age group? Does it say up there? 
Seventh through twelfth graders, good job. Just read the screen, okay? How about that? Let's just, yeah, let's just read it. Okay, that's our house. That's our address, so there you go. Hey, I think that first week we're going to have the parents as well. So if you have a teenager and you're tr- you think that, you know, just starting week one, you're just going to throw them off to us, that ain't how this works, okay? <laughs> we are not glorified babysitters, all right? So, no, the first week you get to come hang out with us um, and, uh, and then after that, we'll start taking them by ourselves. But uh, what else have I got? Was that it? Oh, yeah, Christmas Eve service. Just remember, no, ser- I've been telling you every week, but just remember, no services that morning. Instead, we're going to come together that evening and have a Christmas Eve service together. So anything else, Crystal? Is that it? What's that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay, Eddie, we pray for us, please. Thanks. Dear and gracious Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for this wonderful message you've given us this morning. Father, I pray that we, we take it and we receive it and we implement it into our hearts, Lord, to help us to continue to draw closer to you. And Father, we thank you so much for the, sending your son to die on the cross for, for our sins, Lord, as we remember that during this season of, of Christmas, Lord, we remember what the Savior did for us. Father, I pray that you be with everybody as we go back to our homes this morning. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.